in Andrea. Equity, equity and inclusion initiative to create a diverse and inclusive campus environment and community. We kick off this three-part series with Dr. Gaspar Rivera Salgado. He received his doctorate in sociology from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and is currently project director at UCLA Center for Labor Research and Education, where he teaches classes on work, labor, and social justice in the United States and immigration issues. He also directs the Institute for Transnational Social Change. He has previously held positions at several universities in the United States and was named the 2004-2005 Prince Klaus Chair in Development and Human Rights at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. He currently serves as an advisor to several Hispanic Latino organizations in California and Mexico and has extensive experience as an independent consultant on transnational migration, race, and ethnic relations and diversity trainings. He was appointed by Mayor Eric Garcetti in 2004 to 2017 as Vice President of the Human Relations Commission for the City of Los Angeles. Among his publications include Indigenous Mexican Migration in the United States and the volume Just Neighbors, Research on African American and Latino Relations in the United States. Please welcome Dr. Rivera Salgado. Thank you so much for that great introduction, Andrea. And I wanna thank Toro University for the invitation, but especially Gail Cummins and Andrea Garcia um, for being such gracious hosts. I'm gonna start uh, sharing my, um, my screen so I can project a PowerPoint presentation that I have prepared. So, um, I have to say that I've been, I have a lot of things to share with you all, but I want to have the opportunity to also uh, have some interaction uh, with the participants. Uh, I'm going to speak for about uh, 35, 40 minutes so that we can have some time at the end to uh, interact and to actually I encourage you to ask questions through the Q&A feature. And um, Andrea will help me at the end uh, to read those questions so we can um, uh, respond to them. Uh, I'm so happy that Toro University is celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month. I've been thinking a lot about uh, the Latino Hispanic community uh, lately. And uh, if any of you would like to follow up with me in about any of the issues that I will be commenting today, here's my um, email so you can reach out to me also, I'm gonna make uh, this PowerPoint presentation available to both Gail and Andrea, but also you can contact me if you want further information about this. I teach entire classes on this topic, so the challenge is really to summarize the main features of this topic in uh, 40 minutes, but I will try to give my best. Um, but uh, um, just to let you know, I want to hit on four major themes in uh, my presentation today. And really, this is, uh, these four points are the main takeaways that I want you to carry with you at the end of this presentation. One is a broad understanding of diversity and what we mean when we talk about diversity. Also, a deeper understanding about how diverse is the Latino communities and how these presents challenges to work with this community, especially all of you that are in the healthcare sector, education, uh, you will find hopefully this information useful as you engage with this uh, community. And then lastly, I want to start a conversation about best practices uh, that professional can the professionals in, in all these different sectors can develop to be efficient and effective as they engage with this community. And to start, I want you to think about four questions. And of course, there's not, um, this is not a test, but I want you to see if you can um, come up with some answers. And also, um, hopefully by the end of today's presentation, you'll have a better answer for these questions. So I want you to think about what is diversity for you? When we talk about diversity, what are the things that come to your mind? Um, how do we measure diversity? How can we think about diversity? Um, 
And what are the consequences of our frame that we use in thinking about diversity? The second question, I want you to think about diversity within the Hispanic Latino community. And just a warning about the language that I'm gonna be using. I use Hispanic Latino interchangeably, and also I'm gonna discuss the politics of these terms. So hopefully by the end of uh, today's presentation, you'll have uh, your own opinion. And if you're Hispanic Latino, you also would have a, a stronger opinion about how you identify yourself and why. The third question is about uh, linguistic and racial diversity within the uh, Latino group. So I want you to think uh, whether or not you know the answer to this question. How many languages are spoken in Mexico? By the end of uh, the presentation, you will be able to know. And also, if you have work in any uh, of rural areas in California, I'm sure you uh, encounter also uh, Mexican migrants who do not speak Spanish or English. So uh, this is the language that some of these migrants speak. Mixtec, so is mystic a dialect? What's your answer to that? Before launching into the main um, theme of uh, our presentation today, I want to acknowledge that we're facing unprecedented times. I'm about to start my quarter here at UCLA online, and uh, I've been hearing a lot about uh, from my students who are really um, thrown into this uh, crisis mode right now. Not only we are having a national reckoning on race, uh, the movement for Black, Life, Black Lives Matter is active in many cities in the United States, focusing on the long history of uh, racism and police violence in the United States. Um, is, uh, this is constantly on the news, and I'm sure um, you've seen uh, protests in your neighborhoods. So the issue of race, racism, is with us every day. And finally, we really need to come to terms with it about its political, economic, and social impact. Also, we're living under global pandemic. The COVID-19 uh, virus uh, is still active. We have reached uh, 30 33.4 30 million cases globally. Just in the United States, we have surpassed the 7 million mark. And also, sadly, we have uh, uh, surpassed the 1 million mark of people who have died because of COVID-19. So this is a truly global pandemic. Uh, I have family in different parts of Latin America, and in talking to them, all of them are feeling the effects of this global pandemic. And it has created a lot of uncertainty, and definitely it has shaped and created a, uh, a different challenges for our uh, social uh, dynamics and for our work and how we uh, take classes and, um, and socialize with the people that we love. So let's keep this in mind too. And if it wasn't enough to be having a reckoning on, um, on race issues in the United States and dealing with a global pandemic, of course, one of the outcomes of this global pandemic is uh, the economic crisis that we're facing. And one of the key indicators of this economic crisis is the amount of people, over 40 million um, um, US um, uh, residents who have lost their job and have filed for unemployment. We have reached over 20% of unemployment rate. So this is very unprecedented and everybody is affected by this. So uh, let's acknowledge that as we discuss um, uh, this topic of Latinos Hispanics. And lastly, but not least, we're having an election, a very consequential presidential election this coming November. Um, I'm sure all of you are thinking about it. We just had our uh, first uh, presidential debate last night, and it was all over the front page news. So here is the, um, the front page news of the New York Times uh, with uh, their analysis about the presidential debate. So I know all of this is waning on our minds, and I want to really try to focus and see how all these issues about race, uh, the global pandemic, the economic crisis, and the pressure of how that is shaping 
the Latino community, but also how our thoughts about the Latino community are shaped by these events, by how we think about race, how we think about the economic paradox. And I want to suggest that um, there are several critical issues that we need to think when we think about the Hispanic and Latino community. And one issue is that this is a very misunderstood uh, community. And I'll go over those issues. Um, but the, the main message that I want you to uh, take away, especially living in California, is that the presence of Latino community is the major indicator of a demographic revolution that this country, that our state, has experienced in the last 40 years. Uh, it started especially in the mid-1960s with the first major uh, immigration uh, reform under the Kennedy-Johnson administration when the quota system was ended and family reunification was instituted as the main vehicle to allow immigration. That 1965 immigration reform bill uh, opened the floodgates and the, um, the immigration changed dramatically its sources from Europe to both Latin America and Asia. So we have uh, this demographic revolution didn't happen overnight, but especially it started in the 1960s, but it really took off in the 1980s. And Latinos and Hispanics are part, front and center, of this um, um, demographic revolution. We're gonna start by looking at some of the major numbers. And I know many of you uh, might be very data-driven, might like numbers, might like um, um, uh, some uh, indicators. And so this is, uh, these are some indicators from the census about the size and shape of the Hispanic Latino community. But I want you to, uh, I want to start with a projection, the official projection of the census about the growth in the next 40 years of the Hispanic Latino community. It is projected by the census that in the year 2060, uh, in 40 years, 28%, almost one third of the entire US population will be of Hispanic Latino origin, reaching over 1 million, 11, um, 111 million people in the United States will be or of Hispanic um, in uh, Latino origin. But not only that, right now, um, the, uh, as, we, uh, as we process the annual um, internal reports for the census, and we're gonna have, we're under uh, uh, experiencing and the U.S. government is taking a census actually right now is the every 10 years uh, it will uh, end collecting this information at the end of uh, October or November and then we'll have new numbers but as of right now uh, the census um, uh, can tell us that there are 62.3 million uh, Hispanic Latinos in the United States so they're 19% uh, of the population. And by this census and by the census rec own recognition, Hispanic Latinos are the largest ethnic um, racial minority in the United States. So this is interesting. And this is one of the, um, um, when I said that the Hispanic Latinos are a very misunderstood population, this is the first one. So um, the way we conceptualize Latinos and Hispanics are as an ethnic and racial minority. And now um, since the population has surpassed the uh, size uh, and scope of the other racial minorities, and of course uh, we have to think about African-Americans and their long history in the United States. For a long time, the way we have thought about racial relations in the United States was in this um, uh, binomial mode, right? Uh, white and black racial relations. But with the huge increase of uh, the Asian migration since the 1960s and the tremendous increase of the Latino community, now we have to really start thinking about the racial dynamics in the United States from one of biracial dynamics to one of multiracial dynamics. So I think that's one 
key point that we need to, um, we're gonna discuss more in detail later. And as I mentioned, places like uh, California and especially Los Angeles is at the front of this demographic revolution. And you can see the constant um, historical population growth of cities like Los Angeles going from a tiny, tiny speck on this land with 50,000 inhabitants in um, 1890 to becoming the second largest city in the United States by, uh, um, especially by uh, 20, by uh, 2006. So this, uh, the presence um, and increase in the Latino population is part and parcel of this massive economic growth of the states and places like in the West and especially California. And I think this is important for uh, professionals in, um, in sectors such as healthcare, education, um, where if you are a professional in California, chances are is that you're going to be interacting a lot with Latinos and Hispanics. So it's important to understand uh, different ways in which you can uh, understand the diversity within this community. So this is again, another uh, projection of the census. And I'm gonna go a little bit faster, picking up the pace because there's uh, more uh, information that I wanna share, but you can ask me about any of these slides in the question and answer. So one, uh, indicator of um, diversity is uh, language use. And if we, if we hold the projection that in 40 years, Latinos, Hispanics will be uh, almost one third of the country, one of the implications is that a lot of these folks uh, are bilingual. And in some cases, as we pointed, as we'll uh, discuss towards the end, of uh, this presentation, uh, they're also trilingual even. So this will make the United States already, the, uh, uh, this presence of Latino Hispanics makes the United States the second largest Spanish speaking country in the world. And in 40 years, it will surpass Mexico because Mexico does the other, does the largest Spanish speaking country. The population of Mexico, Mexico is uh, staying steady at around close to 120 million. So um, it's not growing that fast. So it's, um, the United States is in competition with Mexico to, be, to see who's the largest Spanish speaking country in the world. And as I mentioned, uh, LA, uh, uh, cities like Los Angeles is uh, really at uh, the um, forefront of this um, um, uh, uh, demographic revolution. And one of the sources that we have about how to think, and one of the sources that shapes our mind about how to think about Latino Hispanics is the census. And this is a typical printout um, of, uh, from the census information that shapes the way we think about uh, racial and ethnic diversity in the United States. So take a look at this printout about the Los Angeles County population. And you can notice several things. So um, in the County of Los Angeles, there are uh, a little bit over 10 million people. And let me see if I can choose my, uh, uh, my laser pointer here. Over 10 million people uh, in the state of California, there are uh, 39.5 million people. If we go, by the breakdown of, um, of uh, uh, the racial composition of the state, we find out there are two numbers that we need to pay attention here. That if we count um, the population by uh, uh, use one race, we find out that one number that we get is that the state of California is 70.7% white and uh, uh, sorry the county of los angeles and it mirrors almost exactly the population of the state however if we disaggregate these numbers and take out and count only latinos because the the census picks up on this uh dual dimension for uh, latinos and hispanics we find out that latinos by themselves count for 
percent of the population in Los Angeles and 39.4% of the population in California. So you can see the disparities here and the white population goes from 70.7% in the county of Los Angeles to 21%. And in the state of California as a whole, the white population, if we disaggregate this data, goes from 71.9% to 36.5%. Uh, with 39 of these uh, uh, white residents consider themselves uh, Hispanic Latinos. Why is it that Hispanic Latinos are aggregated with whites? So that's one question that we should ask ourselves. And these are the numbers for cities like Fresno, the same thing um, in a lot of these rural communities in places like Los Angeles, Latinos uh, are more than one third to almost half of the population in all these uh, cities. And of course, if you read the uh, fine print in the um, in the census um, uh, data, you'll find immediately that there's a lot of notes that you should be aware of. And that one key note that, uh, that we need to be aware of, especially when we work with diverse communities in California, is that Hispanics might be of any race. So that's, um, that's um, an interesting fact that we should keep in mind. And this is because the way the census um, collects racial information. I don't know if you have um, filled out your census this year, but this is, um, I think, a source of a lot of anxiety to a lot of people because all of us, regardless of how we consider ourselves or regardless of how other people view ourselves, uh, filling out the census creates a lot of anxiety because we have to check a box. And this is especially uh, incredibly difficult to understand for uh, immigrants from Latin America and especially Mexican immigrants. Um, in the census, uh, in the current census, and this is a copy of the census form that is currently being used, uh, when you get to question eight, that's the question for uh, Hispanic Latinos, and you have to say whether or not you're Hispanic Latino, but also at the same time, you have to check a box of where you are from, assuming that you are, you are either an immigrant um, or you have developed another ethnic identity because of the heritage of your parents. So it's interesting that uh, if you are of Mexican origin, you can either say that you're Mexican, if you were born in Mexico and you migrated, you, you could check this box. But also, if you, your parents are Mexicans, but you were born in the United States, you can either say that you're Mexican-American, but also you have the option um, to say that you are a Chicano. It's interesting that um, Puerto Ricans are listed here because uh, Puerto Ricans, of course, are U.S. citizens, only that Puerto Rico is not a state, um, is a commonwealth or a colony, as others would say. Um, and also, this is the place where you can have uh, your nationality. So Latinos, Hispanic, um, uh, the Hispanic Latino question really picks up on the, the fact if you identify a Hispanic Latino, but also it gives us good information about diversity of Latinos in terms of nationality, your country of origin. And this is how we come up with these numbers that are the traditional ways in which we look at diversity within the Latino Hispanic community. And we know when we break down the numbers that um, the Mexican origin population is by far the largest of these Latino Hispanics. They're uh, used in, in the Southern California region, they're uh, 78%. And of course, Southern California, that's um, a huge population because also we have the largest concentration of Salvadorian, Guatemalans, Honduras, Nicaraguans, and from other places in Latin America. But as you move to other parts of, of the United States, you can see how there are different Latino groups that uh, become the dominant group. So in, um, 
in uh, the New York uh, Northeastern region, you can see that 28% of those are from Puerto Rican origin and also uh, um, Dominican. So Dominican, the Caribbean uh, immigration is big, especially in the uh, Northeast. But if you go to Miami, 54% of the Latino Hispanic population is of Cuban origin. Uh, in other places like Washington and uh, Maryland, the population of Latinos Hispanics is more evenly divided among uh, all these major groups. So this question about um, uh, whether or not uh, somebody considers themselves Hispanic Latino in the census form is important because it also gives us a breakdown of uh, the nationality of these um, um, Latinos and Hispanics. So this is one way in which we capture, we capture the um, diversity within uh, the Latino community. Either you're born in the United States and you're a uh, uh, Hispanic Latino um, origin population and you identify with that group and then you select uh, more um, a refined identity. But then after filling out the Hispanic Latino question, you go to the race question, which is the following. So after you fill out the form, you have to decide what race you belong to. And this is especially difficult for uh, Latinos, Hispanics. As I mentioned, uh, there is a big um, note in all the numbers that say that Hispanic Latinos can be of any race. So what should uh, Latinos and Hispanic choose? So when you have basically four options in dissension form. And that's, those are the official races, actually, that are counted in the United States. So the first option, of course, is uh, white. And, um, and I have these, uh, let's see if I can move these. Um, and you have white. And here is interesting, because not only uh, within the white population, um, uh, traditional uh, Western Europeans uh, and Eastern and Southern Europeans are counted as white, but also some Middle Eastern and North African population, such as Lebanese, Egyptian, and also um, uh, the population of um, uh, other places um, in Eastern Europe. Also, we have Black or African American, and also if you are an immigrant from sub saharan Africa, you can fit here in the category of Black and African American. And then we have American Indian. And this year, this uh, American Indian or Alaska Native category was opened up to be more inclusive and to recognize that also um, there's a lot of uh, Native populations from Latin America with a big presence in the United States. So they open it up and they give examples that you can be, you can check this box as American Indian or Alaska Native if, if you are not only enrolled in one of the officially recognized tribes in the United States, such as the Navajo Nation or Blackfeet, Blackfeet tribe, but also if you are the descendants of one of the uh, indigenous groups in Latin America, such as the Mayan or the Aztecs. And um, so this is interesting. Um, uh, but also these... Uh, um, um, Alaskan um, natives are so are uh, counted here. And then we have the another very confusing uh, category, which is Asian Americans. And remember how uh, the Latino Hispanic question asks for a nationality, assuming that Hispanic Latino is our ethnic identity, meaning that is a shared social identity shared by members of that group that self-identified as uh, Hispanic Latinos. In the case for Asian Americans, it's asking, uh, nationality becomes a race. So if you're Asian American, you can be Chinese, Filipino, Asian Indian from India. And also uh, you can be a native of Hawaiian, Samoan, and other Pacific Islanders. So this is kind of the innovation of this census this year, they tried to open up uh, the uh, racial question, but I think uh, it'd be interesting uh, to hear um, whether or not it helped you uh, this year, this uh, 
clarification and expansion of racial categories or it made it more difficult for you. Um, so just to um, start, um, you start to uh, wrapping it up and to get some concepts about these. Uh, we know now that uh, racial categorization is almost an arbitrary um, uh, decision done by the government. Also, we know that it creates a lot of confusion and um, anxiety. And this is a special, race is a special uh, difficult issue for Hispanic Latinos. I wonder if you see the photographs in these slides and you can tell me which one of these persons are uh, uh, Latino or Hispanic. And if you recognize uh, somebody, use, uh, maybe you can share it in the chat. Um, well, the answer is that all of them are Hispanic Latinos, from Bill Richardson, uh, who is a biracial, uh, the son of an uh, um, Anglo and Mexican uh, father, uh, Mexican mother, of course, uh, the famous um, uh, Latin American uh, Ernesto Che Guevara, born in Argentina, Mariano Rivera, the pitcher of the Yankees, Yalitza Paricio, um, uh, mixtech indigenous Mexican who was nominated for the Oscar, and even the conquistador Junipero Serra and uh, president of Peru, Alberto Fujimori, would be considered Hispanic Latinos, even though, and as we said, Latinos can be from um, any race. So here's used to illustrate that that's the case. So how we define um, race and how racial category shapes our mind is very important. But it's important to note that there's nothing in nature that would allow us to decide uh, uh, who's from what race. is basically a concept that is created and that is implemented by government officials in the United States. The Office of Management and Budget that administers the census is the entity that creates changes uh, almost arbitrarily the way um, uh, we think about uh, uh, race and how we categorize race in the United States. So just um, in concluding, we need to uh, think that uh, um, there's a lot of debate about Hispanic Latinos. Um, not only this is an ethnic group, it is assumed that uh, in the category of Hispanic Latinos was created, assuming that these people share a common ancestry, a common origin in one of the places of Latin America. They share cultural traits, they speak, um, uh, one language, but they come from different uh, races. And so you can read about the history of how we came up with the concept of Hispanic Latinos. And this is a wonderful book by Christina Mora, who teaches sociology at UC Berkeley, who basically gives us the historical account of how the concept of Hispanic Latinos was created in the 1970s by the, uh, um, by the census. I would argue that how we think about uh, Hispanic Latinos in terms of ethnicity and race has an impact about how to serve this community. And of course, I'm gonna go very fast on some of these slides because I wanna get to um, um, uh, towards the end of the presentation. There's a lot of political debate about um, uh, how to court the Latino vote, um, investing a lot of money in um, uh, Spanish news media, to some people giving up, saying that there's not such a thing as the Latino vote because you know they're so fractured and they're so diverse. How can anyone develop um, um, uh, an approach to court all the uh, Latinos? Uh, of course, this has had, I think, um, um, we can not only think about race and ethnicity as uh, socially constructed entities, it has a very important impact in policies uh, political representation, uh, and especially in California, there is a large uh, Latino Hispanic agenda and uh, that is embodied by elected officials. And this is a very historical picture for me in uh, the spring of 2016 when um, 
two of the most powerful uh, figures in California politics, the, uh, the Senate pro tem and the Speaker of the Assembly were of Latino origin. And here they are presiding with uh, Governor Brown um, during the signing of, bill, of Senate Bill 3 that would increase the minimum wage uh, to 15. So how we think about race uh, really it shapes our view of how we explain issues such as inequality, access to health care, but also it goes a long ways about how we can explain many of the challenges facing the Latino community. And one of that uh, um, challenges is how we as a nation frame, for example, the immigration debate. Um, this framing can be in both ways, either we can have a positive narrative of people who deserve to be helped, who, uh, who deserve to be supported, or we can have um, um, a negative narrative that leads uh, to the development of punitive uh, policies, such as we've seen in the recent history of, um, of, of the immigration debate. And lastly, it is important to start thinking about not only diversity of Latinos and Hispanics in terms of national origin, but also we need to start opening up the box of nationality to inquire more and to be curious about the great diversity that exists underneath um, uh, uh, that. So for example, and this is used to start um, uh, winding up and, and we can uh, open it up for questions that you might have. One of the questions that I asked you at the beginning is, how many languages are spoken in Mexico? And this is key because one of the key indicators of uh, racial and ethnic diversity is um, languages. We think of um, uh, linguistic diversity as one of the indicators that tell us how diverse uh, population is. And it turns out that Mexico is one of the most diverse places in Latin America. Um, I don't know what your answer was, but there are 68 indigenous languages spoken in Mexico. And these indigenous Mexicans are part of the migration that is coming to the uh, United States. And just to conclude, I want, to, I want you to start thinking also about um, national origin population and how diverse they are. So if you start being curious, for example, about diversity within the Mexican population, and you Google, for example, how many languages are spoken in Mexico or the census result, you would find out that close to 21% of the Mexican population self-identifies as indigenous. From here, 7.2 million of these self-identified um, indigenous um, speak um, another language different than Spanish. So one of the result of this is that in uh, serving and in dealing with the Mexican community, you will find out that there's a lot of diversity, linguistic, cultural and ethnic diversity within this population. And I would say that that's one of the challenges to start thinking about Latino Hispanics, not as a homogeneous community, but as a highly diverse uh, linguistically racial and ethnic community. And we can discuss a lot of that. And I'm hoping that if you're interested, I can share a lot of research about diversity, not only uh, within Mexico, but for example, uh, the presence of um, Afro-Latinos, something that sometimes we don't, um, we take for granted is the historical fact that uh, more than close to two thirds of the African diaspora, the people that were enslaved uh, between the 15 and 1800s uh, went to Latin America, two thirds and one third came to the United States. So the presence of Afro-Latinos is huge in, in Latin America. Also, there were uh, close to 20 million uh, indigenous peoples just in the Mesoamerican region. And those people are still with us. And those people are now part of these large, large exodus of migrants coming to the United States. So I'm gonna leave it here and I hope that you have questions for me and we can engage a conversation about any 
all these uh, information that I'm giving you as we think about Hispanics and Latinos in the United States, but also in California. Andrea, are there any questions for, for, for us? There are, thank you for that amazing presentation. Very interesting, thank you. Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, there was a growth in Latino Hispanic immigration in the 60s and 80s. Can you discuss some of the factors in place that influenced that immigration? Yes, uh, in the 1960s also marked the end of the Bracero program. The Bracero program was a guest worker program that was instituted from 1942 to 1964. It employed close to 5 million uh, Mexican immigrants, and it set the, set the basis, actually, for further migration of Mexican or your population. Uh, whole industries like uh, agriculture become entirely dependent of this Mexican immigration. In 1965, when um, the Immigration Origin Act was amended and it allowed for family reunification, Mexican immigrants already were posed to use that to continue migrating. They, they had jobs and they continued to do that. So family reunification became the main vehicle through which uh, uh, Latinos increased their presence and especially the Mexican orange population. This increased dramatically in the 1980s when these uh, migratory networks uh, institutionalized. But also in the 1980s, was the moment where a lot of Central Americans also started coming to the United States because they were experiencing a lot of uh, civil wars, especially in, in uh, the region of Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala. So the 1980s was a moment where really the floodgates uh, were open uh, for a massive increase of uh, Central American and Mexican population. Uh, the 1980s are known as the lost decade in countries like Mexico. Mexico was experiencing a huge economic crisis. So that increased the incentives to move to places like California. And of course, California had that impact and we know the results of this. Uh, California implemented in the 1980s some very draconian immigration policies such as Proposition 187 and other restrictions um, um, to immigration. So uh, there were some pull factors, but also pull factors that attracted this uh, massive number of uh, Mexican immigrants. Of course, Latinos and Hispanics have been around uh, places like the Southwest before this uh, region was part of the United States. It was part of the uh, um, the greater California part of Mexico uh, before the US uh, Mexican uh, American War of the 1840s that uh, ceded one third of the territory uh, to the United States. So, uh, and that's why the diversity of Hispanic Latinos is huge. Some of these Hispanic Latinos can trace their route to, uh, to these uh, before the 1840s. Uh, and some of these Hispanic Latinos are new arrivals, especially since the 1980s. Great, thank you. Um, as I am on the journey of applying to medical school, if you know, how diverse is the field of medicine or health related disciplines in terms of inclusion with Hispanic Latino communities? Thank you for that question. Of course, um, generally in the higher education, um, things are getting better, but still we're not there. Uh, this year, uh, the UC system and the Cal State system um, um, uh, just uh, 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 allowed for the uh, greatest diverse group of incoming freshmen to higher education to both of these systems. Um, some of these um, uh, uh, higher school uh, institutions of higher education, such as UC Riverside and UC Merced, are now majority Latinos, actually. So Latinos are... Uh, and especially in the Cal State system. However, we're not doing that well in the professional um, uh, uh, sectors, in uh, healthcare, in law, in business, in engineering. All of those are still the uh, participation of Hispanic Latinos um, uh, is very minimal. And this, has to, and this is a complicated uh, story, but it has to do with the structural issues. It's not only access, but also is um, a lot of these um, uh, students from uh, Latino Hispanic origin 
you know, go to school in some of the poorest um, uh, school uh, uh, districts in, in California. Uh, California, as you know, is one of the um, uh, places where it does not invest a lot in these uh, basic infrastructure such as education. The way we fund education is on um, uh, property taxes. And since the 1970s, those have been uh, curtailed, especially in places like California. So we still need to do a lot for professional schools, for the healthcare industry, and for other major industries to make an effort to be inclusive. And not only of Latinos, Hispanics, but also of African Americans and other uh, and Native Americans. These minorities are highly underrepresented. Uh, however, I think that is, uh, things are changing. And now we have opened up a huge pipeline with uh, the incoming freshman class in the UC system and the California State University. But uh, we need to really uh, pay attention to this pipeline and support all these students. Thank you. What is your perspective on Latinidad, a Spanish language term that refers to the various attributes shared by Latin American people and their descendants without reducing those similarities to any single essential trait? Thank you for that question, because that answers the question of how should we call ourselves Hispanics of Latinos? And as you can see right away, this is a political question. Um, what aspect of our history as peoples are we going to bring up? Um, are we, as Hispanic Latinos, are we considered a group because we share a common language, because we share a common origin? How are we going to reckon with racial diversity and the long history also of oppression of racial minorities in uh, places like Latin America? We're being uh, Afro-Mexican, we're being um, uh, indigenous, carries a huge social and economic cost in terms of discrimination, in terms of uh, lower economic status, lower opportunities for education, just like in the United States. So racial hierarchies do exist in, um, in Latin America, and we need to recognize that. Um, this debate plays out differently in different regions, and um, maybe many of you uh, who consider yourselves uh, Hispanic Latinos come from places like Miami or New York, and I'm sure that you have to start navigating this uh, debate here in California. And in California, really for a long time, uh, the main debate has been about, because of the Mexican origin population being so dominant, uh, the debate within the Mexican origin population is, where shall we uh, put our uh, political destiny, our political future? Are we a racial minority and should we develop very close uh, relationships and political alliance with other racial minorities, such as African Americans, Asian Americans, and American Indians. And that has been sort of the underlying assumption of uh, um, social identities that have been created in California, such as the Chicano movement. It was uh, Chicano, the Chicano movement was a clear social political identity that was created by people who decided that the political fate of the Mexican origin people was connected to the fight of other racial minorities. And that has been actually the underpinnings of multiracial coalitions that have shaped the political landscape in places like um, uh, the Bay Area and in places like Los Angeles. But this same debate has played out uh, differently in places like Miami, where um, the majority of Latinos Hispanics uh, consider themselves Hispanics. Uh, in contrast, for example, the LA Times does not print the word Hispanic, and uh, they just print the word Latino. And of course, um, I think the concept of Latinidad as an expression of um, um, reconciling the fact that we have a long history in Latin America, that we come from a very complex region, but also that being in the United States, the process of migration has changed and shaped how we live our lives, how we view ourselves. And really in the United States is where we have this very interesting debate about Latinidad, Latino, Hispanic. This debate is unique 
to uh, Latinos and Hispanic origin population in the United States. This is not a debate that is done, uh, that is take place in, in Latin America. And so I think that the process of migration um, has allowed for the creation of opportunity to start uh, uh, forging new sense of common identity. And I think we're in the process of doing that. And uh, we're in the process of uh, creating a political future. And this is, I think, the tension. Um, uh, racial, ethnic, and identity politics um, require a strong uh, identities. At the same time, these strong identities uh, hide um, and, um, uh, racial diversity within these groups. And I think that's what we're reckoning within the Latino Hispanic community. Do we rec how do we recognize the diversity and at the same time, how do we forge a common political agenda? And that's to be seen. I mean, that's what's exciting about research on Hispanic Latinos, that we're seeing this story unfolding uh, as we uh, uh, move forward. Thank you. Next question. I often see non-white Hispanic on forms, so it begs to ask, what is Hispanic white? Well, um, my argument is that racial categories are uh, social creations. And it's interesting that, for example, as I mentioned, in places like Mexico, we have a racial hierarchy. And we have a history of uh, racism. And also we have a history of um, um, aspirational whiteness because it gives you privilege. So just in California, for example, in the 2000 census, Hispanic Latinos chose white uh, in 59% of the cases. So that is interesting. And you wonder, um, what is that about? What is that racial identity? And I think it's translating into politics. We have to recognize that um, Racial hierarchies exist and racialized projects exist in places like Latin America. So immigrants from Latin America do not come as blank slates um, when they come to the United States. There's a lot of racial um, conditioning that occurs. And also there's a very strong, strong anti-indigenous discourse and anti-blackness discourse. And a lot of the very progressive uh, Latinos in the United States are dealing with that and they're speaking about a process of decolonization to deal with this. So let's don't get confused. Um, uh, racial projects exist and we need to really approach it from a critical perspective, recognizing that. Next question. One of my primary care providers is the first DACA medical graduate from UC Davis. What is the status of DACA at UCLA and the UC system? Well, as you know, DACA, the Deferred Action uh, for uh, Childhood Arrivals, was uh, an executive order issued by President Obama that um, uh, protected basically uh, young immigrants who had come uh, to the United States uh, from deportation. It was an executive order so it's not a law, it's a discretionary order to ICE, to Immigration and Council of Enforcement, not to deport uh, uh, dreamers, these young people who are undocumented here. Given the fact that they were protected as, as status, they were issued working permits and a social security number so they could uh, 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 gain employment and also get access to foreign, to some form of financial uh, support, especially in California, there were um, uh, there was support at the state le a state level, and um, and they were they were allowed then to uh, gain access to to higher education. Um, the research that is being done on DACA recipients is that these. Uh, protected status allow them to really attain incredible um, educational gains and also economic gains. Uh, their uh, educational and economic opportunities increase dramatically 
by uh, this um, um, executive order. Of course, that's under, under threat from the very beginning when this executive order was issued. Um, uh, there was a political debate in, uh, under the current administration. The Trump administration said that he was going to end this protected status and it's still um, to be uh, decided um, um, about whether or not uh, uh, it was uh, in the Supreme Court, I don't remember the, the, the outcome, but it's still the Trump administration is trying to look for ways in which it could end the, uh, the protected status. And uh, so that's why, I mean, this is part and parcel of the current political debate and the importance of the presidential election coming in November. Thank you. Uh, we have just a few minutes left. Do you mind answering another question? Of course, go for it. <laughs> California used to be under the rule of Mexico. How has this history impacted our climate today? Well, you know, it was um, Mexico gained its independence from Spain in 1821. Um, California was ceded to the United States in 1845. So there were um, 24 years uh, uh, where California was part of uh, Greater Mexico. I think there is a long history, and I think that shaped sort of the origin of this state. So there were already um, Californians living here in, uh, in 1849 when um, gold was discovered in California. There was a massive exodus of um, uh, whites from other parts of the United States, but also an exodus from, you know, other parts of the world. Chinese immigrants came uh, and also Mexican immigrants. So I think from the, the very origin, we have to really think about California as pointing out and illustrating all the contradictions of the United States. People were here, Native Americans were here, and uh, uh, Native Americans were displaced and made invisible in this process of conquering the West. So I think we have to acknowledge that long history uh, and the uh, complexity of this history. I think that now with the big princes of Latino Hispanics, I think that um, this history cannot be lost. And I think it's an opportunity uh, and it's a social experiment. How is it that we're gonna build um, social space where people from different parts of the world, from different races, uh, who speak different language can come and prosper and uh, live under um, a, and develop a democratic uh, system. And I think that this is a great social experiment, experiment and it's to be seen how we address all the contradictions that we're faced. But all of you are part of that experiment and all of you are part and contributors to the future of the state. So what you say and do will matter for the future of places like California. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are rounding off uh, to one o'clock. I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add, any final thoughts? Well, just that, um, of course, I hope that uh, this uh, sparks your curiosity to also pose more questions. There's a lot more to, to find out. There's um, a lot of um, interesting facts of, uh, to think about how that's going to shape your professional career. And chances are, if you go into the medical field, you're going to interact with the Latino Hispanic community. So this is, will be part and parcel of your professional development. And it's great to be in, um, in organizations that are uh, inform oriented and that are curious. And I think this is going to be part of your uh, professional development. So it's great to be here and it's great to see, be celebrating uh, Hispanic Heritage Month with you all. Thank you. Thank you. We have some great comments on the chat box. Uh, greatly appreciate all of this and your time and the insight. Uh, certainly more we're leaving today knowing more than we did before. And I uh, just want to remind everyone that we have at 3.30 today Latina education leader activists. And our next speaker series is next Wednesday at 12 o'clock. And that is with Dr. Judy Castro. And the topic is don't lose sight of your goal, dream, believe, and act. I thank you. I thank everyone for attending and have a great day. Thank you.